Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Spilling Sea. I am your host, Tiffany Daniels. And folks, we are going back to that lovely world of the Judge Rotenberg Educational Center Incorporated versus the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Now, like always, folks, just a few heads up. First of all, you will find the link to the court documents in the description box, as well as the video that kicked off these series on the JRC, as well as to shut the Judge Rotenberg Center down petition. If you haven't signed that already, please do. Also, while we are discussing the JRC, we do include, depending on the video, vivid descriptions or actual footage of disabled people being tortured and abused. If you have young children present, please, at the very least, wear your headphones. Also, folks, if I trip over any legal jargon, or if I trip over my words because it's 5.52 a.m. in the morning, if you hear the beeping of my microwave because my tea is ready, Please, first of all, ignore that, and my apologies in advance. <clears throat> all right, so without further ado, we are on to see the FDA's Exemption 6 withholdings. Excuse me. The plaintiffs also contest the sufficiency of the defendant's withholdings under Exemption 6 which permits agencies to withhold personal and medical files and similar files, the disclosure of which would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Okay, so I was wrong before, but they do indeed want to violate HIPAA and get a hold of these people's medical information. Why am I not surprised? Let's hear their bullshit reasoning, shall we? FOIA's strong presumption in favor of disclosure is at its zenith in this Exemption 6 analysis. Review of personal privacy withholdings under Exemption 6 proceeds in stages. Stage 1 requires the court to determine whether the records are personal, medical, or similar files covered by Exemption 6. If the records are such files, in Stage 2, the court must then determine whether the disclosure would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of privacy. Duh! They're medical records. Internal quotation marks omitted. Stage 2 embeds its own two-level review. The first inquiry is whether disclosure would compromise a substantial, as opposed to de minimis, privacy interest. Next, if disclosure would infringe a substantial privacy interest, the privacy interest must be balanced against the public interest in the release of the records. Only one public interest matters, the extent to which the disclosure would serve the core purpose of the FOIA, which is contributing significantly to the public understanding of the operations and of activities of the government. Oh boy, I guess just throw government paranoia in there and we're all good, right? Kill me, it's too early for this level of stupidity. Emphasis and alterations in original. In other words, disclosure of government records under FOIA is meant to help guide the public stay informed about what the government is up to. AAILA. For Exemption 6, the DC Court Circuit has put the burden on the agency to establish that any withheld records meet the statutory balancing test. So they have to prove that coughing up the medical records of the, the people that testified against your skin shock devices is an invasion of personal privacy. You, you would think that would be automatic, right? The defendants have applied Exemption 6 to personal or medical files that identify JRC patients. Reply at 31. As to step one, the defendants correctly state that Exemption 6 applies to those records because the statute explicitly covers medical files. Exactly. 
For step two, the defendants contend that releasing identifying information would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of privacy, as well as a threat, folks. These folks are known to go and intimidate people. They torture people, for Christ's sake. Do you really think it's beyond them if they were given names of those who choose to, to not cough them up during the panel, that they wouldn't go and find them and try to persuade them to change their minds publicly? God. And the public has no apparent interest in gaining access to medical records of individual JRC patients. Alternatively, the defendants assert that the public's interest in disclosure yields to the privacy interest. People, what the JRC does best is they come at it like they're all innocent and they just want those medical files so that they can prove that their so-called treatment doesn't have any long-term effects, right? That They're trying to push themselves as the completely misunderstood innocent party who is the only one out there in the world who can help these poor children. That is what they're putting out there, right? But here's the thing. If they get a hold of those medical records, they will just simply use them to defend their position. But look, see, they're violent, they're this, they're that. It's ableism in a nutshell. It's using one's medical history to blame the victim. We've seen it all before, right? And that's not even just the least of the nasty crap that they would do. It also would be, well, they would use it for witness tampering to find the people that testified against them that choose to remain anonymous. If they got access to those medical records, then, yeah, they got access to it all. So, there's also that. Okay. Let's read this little tad bit here. The defendants stress that in Carter v. Department of Commerce and Salas v. Office of Inspector General, the plaintiffs bore the burden of establishing a public interest in disclosure more powerful than the countervailing privacy interests. Carter merely held that requesters had not rebutted the agency's explanation as why disclosing certain identities would infringe a privacy interest that outweighs the public interest in disclosure. When in Salas, a judge on this court placed a burden on the requester to articulate a public interest sufficient to outweigh an individual's privacy request, and added that the public must, interest must be significant. The support for those propositions came from the National Archives and Records Administrative versus Favish. Favish, however, pertained to Exemption 7, which, though narrower in scope than the Exemption 6, is more protective of privacy interests than Exemption 6 and establishes a lower bar for withholding information. In light of authority on which Salas relied, as well as the D.C. Circuit Court's ALA opinion, Salas is not persuasive. The defendants also withheld the identities of lower-level employees of the JRC and contact information of government employees in sensitive occupations. Obviously, protecting them from harassment. You've seen what they tried to pull on Greg Miller. Under Exemption 6, the plaintiffs do not contest with withholdings. Thus, the defendants are granted partial summary judgment as to this category of Exemption 6 withholdings. To facilitate review of contested records in any subsequent round of summary judgment briefing, the defendants are directed to indicate in some manner on a subsequent version of the third Vaughn index or in a separate index the specific record entries withheld under Exemption 6 to protect personal information about lower-level employees or contact information of government employees for which the defendants have been granted partial summary judgment. Relying on the D.C. Circuit's opinion in AILA, the plaintiffs answered that, at a minimum, the defendants have applied an impersonally categorical approach to assessing privacy interests implicated by records containing personally identifying information. The requester had sought from the government records related to conduct of immigration judges. What the hell? 
That's beyond the scope, DRC. What the hell? I, I'm not even... What the hell in regards to immigration judges? Does that have anything to do with your case? The judges' names were redacted from all disclosed records because the government reasoned that, as a blanket matter, the privacy interests of the immigration judges and avoiding disclosure of their names necessarily outweighs the public interest in learning of any of the judges' names. The circuit remanded for a more individualized inquiry, explaining that the government had failed at step two of Exemption 6's tiered review. Because in affording each judge the same privacy interest in her name, the government ignored that the privacy interest at stake was very depending on the context in which it is asserted. On the privacy side of the balance, Wheeler's interest substantially diminished. First, the allegations of misconduct during the dark toe trial are already a matter of public record, as is the refoil. Bleh. Excuse me. Referral to OPR published in the Fourth Circuit decision and the U.S. Attorney's public announcement that it is to referring to the allegations of misconduct, AM oversight. GSA's Exemption 6 redactions obscure which of the publicly named PTT members were re- referenced in or included on certain emails, even though those names are already out of the bag and are no longer subject to a significant protectable privacy interest. Really? For the immigration judges, given the variety and types of complaints and circumstances of individual immigration judges, not every judge has the same privacy interests at stake, and not every complaint would be equally enlightened to the public about what the government is up to. You see, they're building on this idea of paranoia about we got to know what our government is up to. This is overreach. They can't control us and just take away these devices that are, again, torturing children. Sure enough, the plaintiffs have identified ways in which government's assessment of the competing public and private interest papers over important context for records related to at least five people whose names have been redacted from the produced records. First, several withheld records identify former JRC patients. Importantly for privacy interests at stake, some former JRC patients have been very vocal about their experiences at JRC, including speaking with media outlets, testifying at the April 2014 panel meeting, and posting videos about JRC to YouTube. Yet none of the index Entries describing documents that identify former patients appreciate that the patient's public comments might diminish their interest in guarding their identity. That context must be considered. And not everyone who testified who was a former JRC patient was out there in the media. God, the hell is wrong with you people? Well, they're out there, and they're talking about it, so their rights don't deserve to be protected. They may be out there talking about it, but they're not sitting there drawing a roadmap to where the hell they live. They still have a right to privacy, too. (sighs) Similarly, a fourth individual for whom the defendants have reducted identifying information submitted a consumer complaint to the FDA about the JRC's use of GED and declared an intent to share this issue with social media, such as Facebook, to make the public aware of this issue. Yet the Vaughn Index entry for this record says no more than that releasing the client's name would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Second Index. Missing from that analysis is any acknowledgement that the complaint expressed an intent to publicize his or her views. Oh, let's not let the public know what kind of monsters you are. But, oh, please just give us the medical records where we can have an address. While the defendants need not scour the internet to determine what public comments an individual identified in a responsive record has made, the government cannot meet its burden under Exemption 6 by ignoring information sitting on the face of the record. Penalize the victims again, of course. The JRC Pillay book. Finally, the defendants redacted the name of a former JRC employee 
who agreed to be interviewed for a piece that ran on CBS. The JRC's employee's name is reducted from an email that references the employee's participation in the CBS story, and if the corresponding index entry does not discuss the individual's privacy interests, let alone account for how the invited publicity might affect that privacy interest. Although the defendants now concede this particular redaction was improper, <clears throat> the third font index docs not reflect the error has been corrected. This information must be disclosed, and the plaintiffs are consequently granted partial summary judgment as to this record. You're still coming after Greg Miller, aren't you, you assholes? Despite failing to take a nuanced approach to Exemption 6 balancing analysis, the defendants repeat that they have properly applied Exemption 6 because an individual does not forfeit all privacy interests merely by making subpublic statements. The response misses the point. The defendants have not met their burden because they have forgot a necessary step in Exemption 6's balancing standard, properly defining interests on either side of the equation. Redacting the identities of individuals who have publicly associated themselves with the very views that redaction intends to shield, while considering how that welcome publicity changes the privacy interest and properly ascribes a uniform privacy interest to one's identity, and ignores a fact that minimizes any asserted privacy interest. The tag does not survive AILA, says you. Nor does it matter that the privacy interest at stake belongs to the individual, not the agency. Here, the unaccounted for conduct was taken by the individuals whose privacy is online, factoring that context is consistent with the privacy interest belonging to the individual. That doesn't mean we're drawing a moat roadmap to our homes. Okay? <sighs> you two, you all are using the same kind of logic that paparazzi used to in the early 2000s. That, well, they're out in public, so they deserve it. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm sorry, folks. Give me just a minute. I need to find back where we were. Okay, here we go. Despite failing to take a nuanced approach to the Exemption 6 balancing analysis, the defendants repeat that they have properly applied Exemption 6 because an individual does not forfeit all privacy interests by merely by making public statements. Thank you! That response misses the point. How? How does it miss the point? Please tell me why you deserve to have their addresses. The defendants have not met their burden because they have forgone a necessary step in Exemption 6's balancing standard, properly defining the interests on either side of the equation. I think they've done it quite well. It's 126 pages long. Redacting the identities of individuals who have publicly associated themselves with very views that redaction intends to shield. Oh, because they influenced them. You know, of our invisible millions, we, are to, we bought this band, basically. Whatever. Whatever, Karen. Me and my broke ass with my tiny little apartment. Yeah, we totally bought off the FDA. God. Now, considering how publicity changes to privacy interest and properly ascribes a uniform privacy interest to one's identity, it ignores a fact that minimizes any asserted privacy interest. The tag does not survive AILA, nor does it matter that the privacy interest at stake belongs to the individual, not the agency. Here, the unaccounted for conduct was taken by individuals whose privacy is on the line, factoring the context is consistent with the privacy interest belonging to the individual. The defendants must also take a more nuanced approach to assessing the public's interest in the disclosure of identities. Explaining the public interest disclosures also might vary in substantial measure <clears throat> depending on context. In I, bleh, AILA, the circuit explained that the public interest would likely be more pronounced in the case of a sitting immigration judge who continues to make decisions as an employee of the Department of Justice than in the case of a former judge, AILA. That as to put public interest in records of investigations into a prosecutor's misconduct. Oh, you're going there. Okay. 
<sighs> a new rabbit hole. An unsubstantiation, uh, an unsubstantiated allegation, really? That was dismissed as a frivolous might implicate a greater privacy interest or a reduced public interest. While an in-depth investigation that exposed a pattern of abuses across numerous cases would trigger a different balancing of interest. Applied here, the FDA, for example, including the testimony of three individuals formerly on electrical stimulation devices at JRC, and the list of sources that the agency relied on in developing the proposed ban. Gee, how horrible of them. How horrible of them to actually listen to the victims. The public interest in the identity of those people, given their role in the proposed ban, might be stronger than the interest of the identity of another JRC patient. While the court is sensitive to the defendant's burden, this is what the law requires. <clears throat> to say the defendants have not conducted the necessary balancing is not to say that the agency will not eventually be able to support redacting identifying information in all cases if it's justification for doing so were framed in a more targeting manner, AILA. Indeed, as the defendants explain, the names of individuals who have provided information to the FDA might offer no insight into how the FDA performs its statutory duties. Perhaps the minimal public interest in the recent records will succumb to a properly articulated privacy interest because the disclosure of any name risks divulging associated medical information that the individuals themselves have not shared. The defendant must provide the court with the information needed to engage in that balancing inquiry. That has not happened. Oh, now you backpedal. Now you backpedal. We're not the bad guys. We're not, we're not wanting all their medical information, and that, that's what you said, dumbass. You can't clean it up now. The defendants also withheld some records pursuant to Exemption 7. Rather than present any argument as to these withholdings, the plaintiffs simply reserve their right to advance this argument in the future. Such reservation of argument does not suffice to preserve the objection. Now is the time to challenge the defendants' withholdings and to move this case to resolution. The plaintiffs neither the acclimability, I can't talk, of the exemptions nor the defendants' segregability determinations in the court's Thus seems these matters conceded. Without any specific objection from the plaintiffs to focus on the dispute, but upon review of a sampling of the defendants' withholdings under Exemption 7, these withheld records appear appropriate. Withholding of information in a string of DOJ emails is as related to personal information about the former JRC patient that had been gathered for law enforcement purposes. Exemption 7 withholding of information in a string of DOJ emails as related to personal information about former JRC patient who had contacted the DOJ. According to the defendants, are granted a partial summary judgment as to the information withheld under Exemption 7. Again, to facilitate review of these contested records in any subsequent round of summary judgment briefing, the defendants are directed to indicate in some matter a subsequent version of the third Vaughn index or in separate index the specific record entries withheld under Exemption 7 for which the defendants have been granted partial summary judgment. <clears throat> Dear God, how long is this? <clears throat> All right, folks, give me one moment. This is going to be a little bit longer video than usual, so I need to get my tea. I'm losing my voice a little. Sorry, folks. One minute, please.
remind me to never do things when I'm half awake, folks. Moving on. As for the last issue, segregability, FOIA requires that any reasonable segregable proportion of a record shall be provided to any person requesting such record after deletion of the portions which are exempt under this subsection. Producing segregable information is an essential ingredient to sufficient FOIA production, and before approving the application of the FOIA exemption, the district court must make specific findings of segregability regarding the documents to be withheld. I feel sorry for the poor bastard who had to write this. For those findings, the agencies are entitled to a presumption that they compiled with the obligation to disclose reasonably segregable material. Even with that presumption, the agency must provide a detailed justification for its non-segregability, but need not provide so much detail that the exempt material would be effectively disclosed. Excuse me. Affidavits attesting to the agency's line-by-line review of each document withheld in full in the agency's determination that no documents contained releasable information which can be reasonably segregated into the non-releasable portions in conduction with a Vaughn index describing the withheld records suffice. The defendants have provided a sufficiently detailed justification. The defendants have submitted eight affidavits, each certifying to the represented FDA or HHS component performance of a careful page-by-page, line-by-line review of all records. Thank you. The same affidavits confirm that all reasonably segregable information has been disclosed. Corroborating those accounts, those defendants have partially released 1,340 pages of records. Largely, the plaintiff's segregability arguments are repackaged from their arguments against the application of the deliberative process privilege. For example, the plaintiffs argued that the factual and background information contained within these records withheld under the deliberative process privilege should be released. Given the fact that the court is not issuing a ruling on the deliberative process privilege expect as to the draft records, segregability issues as to those withholdings cannot be resolved at this junctive. Thus, the court finds that as to the draft records withheld under Exemption 5's deliberate process privilege, records withheld under Exemption 5's attorney-client privilege, records withheld under Exemption 6 to conceal personal information about low-level JRC employees, and the contact information of government employees, and the records withheld under Exemption 7, the defendants have released all segregable information. Through no fault of either party, this case is erroneous. Indeed, the plaintiff's massive FOIA requests return over 24,000 responsive records to say nothing of the 60,000 records that the CDRH is in the process of producing. Such broad requests are understandable given that the records relate to the agency's regulation and possible ban of a treatment practice that the plaintiffs adamantly believe in. I don't know how they could possibly believe in it. How can you believe that torturing children is going to make them better? Of course, the volume of records is so substantial only because the defendants have been diligently considering the need for regulation for quite some time. Nevertheless, issues relevant to this litigation have not been presented with clarity, and neither party is blameless. On the defendant's side, too much has been painted with too broad a brush. <clears throat> too broad my ass. While the end, at least for now, of the defendant's regulatory work is the proposed ban, the defendants have made an awful lot of intermediary decisions to get from the point at which the JRC did not have to obtain 510k clearance for the GED to proposing a rule that would have banned the GED altogether. <coughs> Fuck them. They need to be banned. Seriously? Because if you torture the kids with autism, they'll get better. Burn that building to the ground. In making with those decisions, the FDA consulted with many individuals, including former JRC patients. Certainly, as a baseline, all JRC patients have a privacy interest in their medical history, but some individuals can exhibit behaviors reflecting a lesser interest in maintaining that privacy. <coughs> 
So they don't agree with what you did to them. Therefore, they should have a lesser right to privacy because they called your ass out on it. The plaintiffs have done no better. Identifying general problems with the defendant's production, but offering only a smattering of examples of those reported problems, which fall short of the obligation under the federal rule of civil procedure. Consequently, the plaintiffs have provided insufficient precision as to how many records, or which records, the plaintiffs are actually challenging, other than the relatively small number from the voluminous Vaughn Index and Dices that are specifically cited in the briefing. Shortcuts, especially with a large body of records, are tempting, and in these cases, both parties have taken some. FOIA litigation works best, however, when the defendants are clear about how and why exemptions have been applied, and the plaintiffs are clear about where they believe the defendants have gone wrong. Of course, going forward, the remaining issues in this case may be narrowed by the parties conferring about the production, with this be, may be narrowed by parties conferring about the production, which... Sorry, I read that twice. This memorandum opinion providing the, some guidance. If these parties require another round of summary judgment briefing, they must do better focusing on which withholdings are still contested. To that end, any subsequent bond index must plainly be identified of records in dispute. So, long and short of it, they are contesting those former JRC students victims whose videos we've seen, those who have come out and publicly condemned the school for the torture and the abuse that they put those students through. But the JRC believes that because they spoke publicly, that they don't have any right to privacy, that their medical information and their contact information should be made available to them. That's the long and the short of it. It's bullshit, folks, and it's bad for you. And I swear to God, if they get away with this, let's just say the outcome won't be quite what the JRC think it's going to be. But that's all we have for now before I go on to a full-blown rant. Um, As always, folks, we don't get very many views on this channel. The few that we do get do tend to get removed from time to time. Don't forget to hit that like button. Hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the comments. I do appreciate your time this morning. And as always, folks, we here at Spilling Tea hope you have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.